How are we doing? I'm really sorry about that picture. You know, I'm going to have to change it. Very old, very old. Anyway, thanks very much, um, and thank you so much. It's actually really cool to be here. I wasn't sure what the Business Agility Conference would be like, and I've just had really good reports about what's going on. I've seen lots of people I know here as well. So, well done, Miles and team. I think it's a brilliant thing to do. Um, really, really good. And I hope that we're going to collaborate on, on doing a Henley Miles Agility thing program. Yes, Miles? Can I commit you to this in public before we start? <laughs> thank you very much. Yes, did I hear a yes, Miles? Yeah, thank you very much. Oh, there you are. There you are, up there. Brilliant. Okay, so I'm just going to ramble on for 25 minutes. I've got a time, and then I'll be shut up, and uh, hopefully that'll be all right. So um, I'm going to start there with a bit of context, because I think this is really important. We talk about agility, we talk about eco economies, and this is the economy of Japan. I'm going to show a few characteristics about it, then I'm going to compare some other economies. And um, that's the context, I think, why agility, creativity, and innovation are so important. So if you look at this, um, exports in 2017, this doesn't seem to be, oh, it does work. Ah, cunning, very cunning. It doesn't work on the LED screen. Okay, I need an old pointer. How about that? That's really clever. So you see, the ICT, and look at this. Look at the number of sectors there are. All these little squares are sectors and subsectors and clusters in that economy. So when you look at the Japanese economy, you can see it's ICT, and, and, and this is sort of machines, and these are automobiles, and this is chemicals, and integrated circuits, and then here you've got sort of raw, you know, primary produce and mining and that sort of stuff, really small. So you can see this is a really diverse modern economy, with multiple sectors and really big. So if you think resilience, what does resilient economy look like? How, what's there an economy that can survive in the world? And, and you know, Japan has few raw materials anyway, so this is an economy hyper successful. Interesting how it looks. Look at the Vietnamese economy in 1995. So you can see what this is. It's coffee, not many sectors. You know, when you compare it with Japan, look at these micro sectors. It's all, you know, you'd have to pixelate it here. Petroleum oils, leather footwear, natural rubber, ICT and all that down there. Okay, so that's a very basic economy. Look at it now 20 years later. See? See? That's what it was. That, that yellow stuff is, is growing and digging stuff out the ground, and brown's digging, digging stuff out the ground. And look how that, where that's gone over there. And look what's happened to that economy. And look at the number of sectors and subsectors there are in there. So imagine the sort of capabilities we need in people to create an economy like that. You, know, you need innovation, you need to have a totally different view, you've got to break free of the chains of the past, you've got to be brave, imaginative, you've got to work in a very agile manner, obviously, because you're working here with loads of inventions and in new areas, and so you need skills that are not monolithic and sort of antediluvian and sort of dinosaur-like in your mind. You've got to have the skills that you're talking about here. Okay, now look at the South African economy 20 years ago. Okay, bingo, oh no, that's, that's it, 20 years ago, okay? So there we are, gold, coal, you know, some high-tech, you know, ferro, ferro alloy, and so we're growing stuff, to get it out the ground, and that's it 20 years ago, you know, a fair number of sectors. Now let's look at the radical transformation in the last 20 years. <laughs> right? So I think, and that's Rwanda. So when we think about the importance of your work, I think it's unbelievably important what you're doing. It's not just that you're in IT or you're just working with Agile. What you're doing is you're representing a way of thinking and a way of working that is probably the most important to transform our economy into a resilient economy that can grow because we haven't grown and the only way we can get a powerful, resilient economy is by building new sectors. And the only way by doing that is encouraging people to learn and think in new ways and develop new skills. And the thing is, we confuse education with intelligence in South Africa. Just because we're educated, I'm afraid it doesn't mean you're necessarily glorifiedly intelli intelligent. I mean, in your case, of course, you are. We know that. <laughs> you know. And of course, just because you're, you're not educated doesn't mean you're not intelligent. Right? So we have an MBA courses, which and many others, that are very representative of the population, 80% black, 52% women. And all our students are, we've got to be triple internationally uh, accredited, all our students are assessed internationally, blind assessed. 
with the Chinese, the Malaysians, the French, the Danes, the Swedes, the Norwegians, the British, the Maltese as well. And our students do as well, if not better, in blind assessed international exams than all those other populations. And somehow people find that surprising. Because there's a thing in South Africa, I think, and it's a history of apartheid and colonialization and what those abusive relationships do to people, is that we think we have to prove we're as good as. Now, the real fact is we've got all the intelligence and talent we need in South Africa. It's just locked away in poverty. It's locked away in a lack of opportunity. So in order to transform South African economy in the sort of way you see here, that Vietnam has done, we've got to approach things very differently. So you are, in my view, you're the forefront, the pioneers, the leaders of the way of thinking that allow people to transition from one world into another by not working in big waterfall projects, by working in continual beta mode, by having an agile, you know, innovative approach, by allowing people to collectively think and work fast and not just be locked into old ways of working. You, you unlock people in the way you're working. And I think that's really, really important for the economy, not just for your businesses. Yeah? Oh, God, I got away with that one. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Oh, I'm just showing you that because every time I look at it, I say, that gives me my mission in life. You know, my, our mission is to transform this. And we have the highest Gini coefficient in the world. And so if you had to think of one thing that's going to help us develop so that all our kids have futures, because none of our kids have futures, unless all of our kids have futures in South Africa, the one thing we can do is to reduce the Gini coefficient. That's to unlock those untalented, clever people who are not getting the opportunity. And the ways you're representing, if we use agile and this in education, can you imagine what the education system would be like? Just brilliant. Okay, but as an ex-pilot, I'm gonna bore you with some things about flying now, about black box thinking. And um, this is why most people never learn from their mistakes. Matthew Said is a financial Times journalist wrote this book, and a lot of you will know about this. I mean, how, how many of you have read this book? Anyone here? Yeah, great, well done. Was it good? Thank God, yes, yes. It could have been really difficult. You said, no, it's a really awful book. You know, but I thought it was good too. And um, why is flying safe? Okay, because it is. On average, I mean, you're safer in the terminal building I mean, you're safer in the airplane than you are in the terminal building, statistically, in terms of deaths. So get out of the terminal onto the airplane as quickly as you can. It's really dangerous in that terminal. Okay, just remember that. Whew. God, thank goodness, I'm in the airplane much safer now. Okay, so, you know, on average, worldwide, 410 people died in aircraft crashes. I mean, that's still a lot of people, isn't it? but there's a lot of people flying. And so of over three billion people, that's one fatal crash in two and a half million flights. Compare that with medicine. My darling wife is a doctor. She's much safer than this. Okay, in the USA alone, 400,000 premature deaths are caused by medical, preventable, preventable medical harm. 400,000 people die because of medical practices that could be avoided just in the USA per annum. Amazing, isn't it? And we can wonder why that is. Okay, well, let's look at why, okay? That's like two 747s falling out the sky daily, or one and a half Airbus A380s, yeah. So, so you don't have to read the book. I'm not gonna read that out because you can read seven times faster than I can, and it saves me talking. We all talk about mistakes and whatever. Um, we're, we're very good at learning from mistakes. I mean, I did some flying in New Zealand once and I had to do some mountain flying. And it, you fly around the fjords there and it's, there's no air traffic control. And so they teach you all these routines and then all the pilots talk to each other. And you have to fly down this fjord and you do have to do a mountain course before you even fly there. You fly down this fjord, you duck around the mountains, which is dangerous because you can't see. And as you go down this fjord, you've got to tuck up against the mountain here. You've got to whip around in this narrow area just at that point to come around and you squiggle around and then you get to the airport where you land. Okay. Well, they taught me how to do this. And so I went up here and I didn't quite, and I, before I should have done, I squiggled around and turned around and there was this Kiwi pilot up here. I might shouldn't have done that. Anyway, that was fine. I thought I got away with it. But then we had this transparent pilot meetings in Queenstown. And all the pilots, all the commercial pilots go there and sit down. 
And they all sit down. It was about a week later. And I think, oh, I'm feeling really comfortable. And one guy said, no, nah, mate, that pommy over there, he turned around right in the wrong place. He's bloody dangerous, he was, in front of like this room of my colleagues and peers. I said, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> that was a bit embarrassing. And then he didn't stop there. He went on for about five minutes. And everyone said, yeah, mate, shouldn't have done that. And the pure transparency of the environment, of the self-managed, self-controlled, self-governed environment, no central control, it was a self-organized system, was so powerful that I never made that mistake again, and nor will I ever. I'm still traumatized. I'm still talking about it. Peer pressure is amazing, and that's how, really, how aviation works. It really, really works on, on these things. So we know this stuff. So <laughs> Excuse me. <coughs> it's not coronavirus, don't worry. Um, okay, this idea of a progressive attitude towards failure. What do we mean by progressive? And progressive, I don't mean like sort of avant-garde. I mean we progress forward with it. Okay, and redefining failure will be unleashed. So this idea of this failure, we know this. I mean, failure is so temporary, you know. All life is failure. I mean, learning is a decreasing series of mistakes. You've got kids, right, in the ice cream cone, you know. One-year-old with the ice cream cone, puff, puff. Up, give it if you're lucky. And slowly the area of error of the ice cream cone diminishes until eventually you've got a round of mouth somewhere, you know, and eventually you can do it, you know. So it's a perfect example of decreasing series of mistakes. Imagine if your kid fell over first time in walk and said, oh, I'm not walking ever again, and never did. You know, so, so learning is always decreasing series of mistakes. So we need that sort of resilience, okay? Um, and that's really important, especially in the world of Trump. Of course, when you know, we, we tend to redefine, uh, we, we want to hold on to our beliefs because it's really painful to let go of them. You know, it's awful. My goodness. I used to think English people were great, you know, colonize the world. And I love Europe. I still think English people are great, but you know, I don't think we're that important anymore, which has been really hard for me to take on, especially after Brexit. But what can I say? But that's my own trauma, you know. Um, we're more likely to frame the evidence than our beliefs. And marginal gains are about really small micro-improvements. I'm going to try and show some examples. That, you would know, is one of earlier photographs of one of you people here. Okay. He's got a house worth 32 million pounds. Can you believe it? So let's look at Beckham and how he got to be so unbelievably good. And... I'm hoping this will work. And you see, by the magic, watch Beckham. Watch this. Beckham is going to do a free kick. Well, Foul. Everyone's screaming. It's the Greeks. The Greeks don't like him. OK, and there he is. And now he's lining up. He's going to take this free kick. Just watch it. We've played two and a half minutes of stoppage time. Oh, there England are. trail by two goals to one. Just an excuse to show some soccer video. Just to this one. Beckham could raise the roof here with a goal. I don't yeah, believe no! it. David Fabulous. Beckham scores the goal to take England all the way to the World Cup finals. That was a moment of glory that I shall never forget. Um, anyway. Give that man a night up. But let's look at how he did that. How did he get so good? This is actually near where he lives. It's a little park. And he and his dad used to come here and sit in this park. And there was a goal somewhere here. And also in the garden. And he used to come and practice. But he didn't just practice a little. He practiced hugely. He would practice hours after hours after hours, day after day after day, obsessively practicing goal kicks, obsessively doing it. And even, even now, he's still doing it. Uh, well, not now, but until he stopped really playing. Um, and he and his dad were playing in this little place in Essex, some, some, you know, really not very glorious area. And, and Beckham's quality of practice was so huge that his ability to do those goal kicks, he's able to see he'll position it there from over there. It's just unbelievable practice. And he's marginally improving all the way. Slight improvements. So... When airplanes crashes, when airplane crashes, which is very rare, you all know about the black box. And, and a black box thinking represents a way of thinking about dealing with data and facts. And it's a very dispassionate uh, process. The first thing we do, and this is your very familiar, is collecting data 
about everything you're doing. And, and data is not interpretation. Data is the video. It's a thing that's dispassionate. You don't add any of your own values or interpretations to data. You've just got to record it. And that's really hard to record anything, anything accurately, as you all know, because witness statements typically differ when you're even seeing the same thing. So the black box does that pretty well. Depersonalizing the information. So the old Deming thing about driving out fear is really important. It doesn't mean you depersonalize accountability, but fear of shame, of course, as we all know, makes people hide stuff. So everybody will use the opportunity to learn. And then we do this whole, whole, whole thing. If a thing's worth doing, right? We all know the statement, if a thing's worth doing, yeah, it's actually worth doing badly to begin with. Remember your golf, not your driving. People are born, I'm afraid, perfect drivers. You know, We could go further on, on, the, on the gender issues around that, but let's not. Okay, you have to lose a lot of tennis game. You have to do really badly to begin with. So you've got to be comfortable with messing up. You really, if you want to learn, you know. So the other thing is don't spin failure as a success. Okay, that's what we always do. We say that failure is great to fail. It's not great to fail. Actually, it's not great to fail. It's failure. But don't get hung up about it. Use it as a progressive sense of improvement. Okay, understanding. Okay. So I'm going to show this, and if there are any motorsport fans here, I'm hopefully this will work. The Mercedes can now call themselves constructors Wolf, champions in 2014. Great job, man. History in the making. Back to back championships for both Mercedes Benz and their British driver Lewis Hamilton. Thank you guys so much. Nico Rosberg takes the championship. Thank you so much, guys. That's a childhood dream come true. And he crosses the line now to become the four-time world champion. Lewis Hamilton does it. Get in there, Lewis. Yeah. Champion of the world. Yes. That's what I'm talking about, guys. It's the double weight. Mercedes AMG Petronas. Rare opportunity world to show champ. British sports people shining. World champ. World champ. World champ. Mercedes are crowned Constructors' Champions for 2019. Oh, yes. Very, very happy for every single team member. Very, very proud. The whole team and all the Mercedes dedicate this to me. We are not taking our foot off the pedal. Okay, so that's Lewis Hamilton. Now listen to Toto Wolf, the team manager. Oh, it's not working. Is this working? Let me tell you what he says. He says, we've won the championship, we've won this, and that's fine, but we're not going back to celebrate now. We're not built like that. The first, before we can celebrate, we're going to go down and do a debrief. How come we didn't do better? What did we do badly in this race? And he's not saying this, and, and that's the way he is programmed. The orientation that Toto Wolff and Lewis Hamilton has, and these high-performing people have, is they just can't go and celebrate. There is a deep orientation, and people find it really uncomfortable to be around them, because it's like they're never happy. It's like, oh, well, you've just done this great thing. Yes, I know, but you know, we should have done X, Y, and Z, and I'd really like to get this wrong. They literally can't. It's a programming of our minds that forces you. The reason is because you know that at every mountain you get to, there's another one behind it. And there's a deep pleasure in that, in that improvement, that marginal improvement you continue to work on. So I'm, this idea, what, what he, 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 he calls this permanent skepticism. And so... He will, it's not cynicism, it's some, but shouldn't we have done better? Shouldn't we have done something else? And it's something that's totally ingrained in the team. Now, this is a leadership mechanism that is hard to manage. See it, say it, fix it. And the idea of utilizing marginal gains, small, small grains. The other thing that's fascinating is the idea of mindfulness. And we, we link mindfulness with meditation, but certainly as a pilot, we had something called situational awareness and airmanship. What we learned, and what I learned at military academy when I learned when I was flying, is that the most important thing was to be able to have a broad situational scan. The airplane that's going to hit you doesn't move relative to you while you're moving. It's always in the same position. So your eyes don't pick it up. So we're taught to do a, a scan. We're taught to literally scan, scan different parts of the sky like this so we can see what's happening and see what's going. So we focus on those things. The thing that's going to get you doesn't seem to move relative to you. Your eyes are drawn to those, those things. And the other thing is about being mindful. 
if a problem happens to you when you're flying, if it unsettles you, if you allow it to live with you, it just compounds your consciousness and it grows and it grows and grows and grows till you get a major accident happening. What you have to learn, you have to learn to manage your mind and manage your perceptions and just let it go. Let it go, man. There's a whole hippie thing about airmanship. And you have to raise your consciousness, you have to be able to see. Now, when we're tense and fearful, what happens is that our minds shrink. There's a wonderful example of Andy Cole and Dwight York, who used to play for Manchester United. And they were these poetic, they were just these amazing players. There was something, but they just knew where they were. They could pass the ball to each other. There was something about them. There's another clip of two very famous people, like Messi and somebody else, you know, Ronaldo or something, but that, those sort of levels, who've been put into the same team and hated each other. And there's this wonderful clip of this ball looping into the penalty area in front of an empty goal. And the next you see, you see these two steam trains running towards it, fixated. And there's the ball, there's the goal. And they whap into each other and fall over, and the ball trickles over the line. Because what happens when you're so deeply competitive is your, your vision narrows. L neurologically, your vision narrows. It becomes target-orientated. And you can't chill and see what's around you. So there's some really deep capabilities we need to look at when we're talking about doing agile and doing flexible learning and working with creativity. The harder you try and hit that golf ball, you know, the less likely I don't play golf. Because, you know, I've, tr I've tried to hit it hard once. I missed it both times, but anyway, don't worry. So the other thing about what we do, we try and, obviously, the, the instinct of human beings seems to be something wrong, find a scapegoat, very happy. You know? And it's also how tyrants rule. They, 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 they get identity groups, people like me, they, they demonize people who are not like me, black, white, Chinese, yellow, green, upper class, lower class, racist class, or whatever ism you want. And all isms are about I'm better and you're not. Unconsciously even. I know, I'm a colonial white male. Okay, so I've had to grapple with those things in myself. You know, it's very hard when you when you when you hold an ism in you, when you're classist or racist or sexist, you don't identify that in yourself. It's really hard to do. So what you do, you are, you project that pain you have, that shame you have onto other people because you can't tolerate it yourself. And that's what often happens in in, in problem situations. We have to learn to depersonalize this. And, and not look at blame, but look at contribution. And in aircraft accidents, all things we know, there are multiple contributions to any accident. So the magic of marginals is that if you look at these tiny, tiny gains, 1% gains, um, I don't understand the math of this, but it looks pretty. If you do that, you do get a lot of that. If you do that, you do get not much improvement. <laughs> believe me, I don't believe it. You know, it's one of those graphs. But let me look at this. This is a tube. Up the top is a fantastic. This they wanted to get the nozzle. This is a venturi that does clever things with pressure. This was the final design, and they tried to work this out with a team, with the, with a, with the, with the whole computer designs, and they couldn't do it. Eventually, they did, and this is from the book. 449, 45 generations of handcrafted designs done by people out of their heads without any sort of scientific, particular scientific interface. They just keep, kept experimenting. And each one, they, every time they found <coughs> a little improvement, they just kept it, and they kept it, and they kept it. And they ended up with a nozzle shape that these engineers reckon they could never have designed through their normal methods. But with a team of people experimenting fast and marginally improving, they found it a highly efficient nozzle. And that's what we will do in design thinking, et cetera. So Sky Team is really, really famous, and I'm not going to show you the video, of working on these marginal improvements, the shape of the helmet, the quality of the cloth, what you eat. Every single person had a different, different clothes, different diet. Um, so they were obsessive about sleep, about mattresses that they took with the team. Everyone had a different mattress. Every tiny improvement made that team work better. So I'm going to jump forward on that out of time there. Um, and the other thing is the idea of pre-mortems, and this is um, this is really important. You know, if you anticipate what's going to go wrong before you start, you've got a really good chance. Now, this is something we don't do. If in an aircraft, we have flight simulators, and we do massive pre-mortems. We deliberately do this. I never know why teams of people don't, before they do a joint venture or a massive acquisition, why they don't do a war game and they war game the whole scenario. Imagine the millions or billions they could save just by getting the team to practice it in like a flight simulator. Why don't we do that? There's a business proposition there. Okay, I've got 36 seconds left. Um, that we've talked about. I just want to end up on this because it's about power distance. This is a rather sad story about Captain Keyes. 
Captain Keyes was an old school pilot with British Airways, and he, there, was a, there was a strike going on among the pilots, and there was a young junior pilot in the, in the crew room, and they got in a massive fight before they took off about this union issue. Captain Keyes was one of those really serious colonial guys, and that's what ended. And what happened is that this is a, a sort of aeroplane that when it reaches a stall, takes a long time to recover because it has a high tail and the wings shield it. They took off, and the airplane kept going slower and slower. Captain, we're doing 147 knots. Our stall speed's 142. <coughs> right, he's like, they were so scared of him, massive powders. Captain, we're doing 145 knots. It's, it's going to crash. Nothing. Well, the airplane stalled and crashed. It turns out that Captain Keyes in the post-mortem was having a heart attack. He was having a heart attack, and the co-pilot was too terrified to do anything about it. And it really shows the, the reason why Scrum is so important, why managing power distance is so important, why having that open communication. The whole of aviation changed because of that. So you know that good statistic rate I started off about aviation in the beginning? It all came from this accident largely. What they did, they changed the dynamics of the crews, they changed the tower power distance, they insisted that people challenge, they institutionalized challenge in the crew. If you don't challenge your captain, they have a thing called pace, probe, is that okay? Alert, I think there's going to be a problem, captain, challenge. If you do this, we're going to crash. Okay, and E, emergency, I declare emergency, I have control, captain. And if you don't do that as a co-pilot, now you have a problem. So they've totally changed aviation to have this m agile, fast communication. And that's why I'm pleased to say aviation is so safety, safe. That's why medicine isn't, because they still have a very high power distance. <coughs> and linking back to those slides I showed at the beginning about the transformation in South Africa, that's why I believe you and your methodologies are absolutely powerful revolutionary changes to help us change the economy. And I really hope you, con you continue with that. And congratulations and well done. Keep it up. I'm out of time, so thank you. <laughs>